Hello, welcome to another episode of Board Gems, my weekly video series, in which I cover an older, okay, hidden gem, long lost gem, it's often actually a famous game, and just a famous game from a long time ago, uh, but usually it's one that people aren't talking about anymore anyway, so I just like to highlight them, push it back against the cult of the new a bit, there's lots of great new games that come out, but I'm here to say, you know, these old ones are still good, we could still be playing them, you don't have to buy the new thing. Although, to be fair, a lot of these games that I cover are you can't buy in store now. So I don't know how useful these videos are, but it's what I know. I'm going to cover it. If it interests you, often they're not like, often they're not crazy hard to find um, used. So at a viewer's suggestion, I put up a geek list on Board Game Geek to say, here's my channel, here's what I'm doing, here's the videos I've done so far. And I've gotten a lot of positive feedback about it, which is which is great. Because when you do these videos, you know, you just do it for fun. And in your head, you tell yourself, it's like, well, you know, it'd be nice if people watch this, but it's not really important, right? You're just doing it for fun. But there is a part of the back of your mind that's like, it would be great if people watched this and also enjoyed it. That would be amazing. So it seems like a lot of people are enjoying these videos, at least to some degree. So I'm really happy to hear that. Gotten a lot of positive feedback, got a lot of new subscribers, so pretty happy about that. Um, seems you like me, but I'm going to test that like right now, because I'm going to cover a game that, hobby-wise, is not considered to be a very good game. And I am going to tell the Board Game Geek community as a whole that, on average, they're wrong about this one. This is probably the lowest rated game that I'm going to cover on Board Gems. It's rated 5.6 on Board Game Geek. Now, anything over 7, it doesn't mean everybody has to like it, but at least everybody kind of can recognize, like, yeah, that is a good game. I can tell. Even if it's not for me, it's good. Like, there's no doubt, or very little doubt. And 6 to 7 is either a bit more divisive or or maybe it's more situational. Like, some sometimes it'll go great, sometimes it'll go badly. Um, not everybody's going to like that game, but games that are below 6.0 are almost universally considered to be a bad game. They may have their fans, but they're few and far between. But I played this game. I, I came into this expecting a terrible experience, and I was so surprised at how wonderful this game is. Um, it's from a family of games. I have them here. This is the Robinsberger Fun for Two line, um, which came out in the early 2000s. Now, um, you know, starting, I think, in the late 90s, uh, Cosmos started a two-player line of board games. It, as far as I know, was a quite a successful hit. I know in the hobby, there's a lot of respect for it. Some not great games, but some great games too. Robinsberger in the early 2000s, I don't know for a fact that it was in response to Cosmos, but in the early 2000s, they started their own line of two-player games, and they only released five games in the series, of which the one I'm going to cover is the lowest rated in the series. And that is Baker Street. Now, Baker Street is designed by Marcel André Casasola Merkel and is published by Robinsberger in, I want to say, around 2000... Yeah, 2003. It's... For ages 10 and up, although that's a bit overcautious, I, I think 8 and ups can play this. In fact, the younger you go, almost the better time or the easier time they will have winning the game. Because, and this is almost certainly the reason why it has low ratings on Board Game Geek, it's a memory game. But this is an extremely well-designed one, and I'm here to say that this is much better than the ratings would have you believe. But I'll show you how it plays first, and then I'll try to explain why it's actually a board gem. To set up the game, you're going to get the three decks of cards. One deck is for each of the two players, and the third deck are the clues. They're just letters. <laughs> but you know, A for apple, D for dagger, that works. I see for anyway. Um, so we're gonna you're gonna shuffle up these. There's um, there's you'll see there's there's a letter, 
and the letters range from A all the way to T. So you're going to shuffle these up and you're going to put them, there's two of each letter, one per letter per player, and you're going to divide this up into five piles and you can arrange the piles in a circle. Each player is going to shuffle up their deck of cards. Now the cards mostly have just values ranging from zero to five. There's also a couple of special abilities which I'll explain later. There's three of them, um, but just shuffle these up and give each player a hand of three cards. The game takes place over a number of rounds. And during the rounds, you're trying to get these clues. In particular, you're trying to get a sequence of seven clues. So it can be A through G, or it could be B through H and so on. Just any combination of at least seven letters all in order. Now each round, generally speaking, only one player is gonna be able to go into a pile and search for a particular letter. And that's the result of an interesting kind of uh, bluffing game. The start player will take any one of their three cards and place it next to one of the piles. Draw a replacement and then call out a number. And that number is an estimate. You are guessing that the sum of all six cards that are currently in the player's hands is at least this amount. It could be greater, that's fine, but it has to be at least this amount. So the lower number you call out, the safer. So this player has eight, they know that they could bid, at, they could estimate at least eight. Eight is safe, right? Any higher really depends on what the other player has and that player doesn't know. But you call out a number, say I'll say eight, right? Now the next player has a choice to make. They can either do the same thing or they can challenge. We'll talk about challenging later. But if you continue, if the green player decides to, uh, to continue play, they take one of their cards and they pick one of the five piles. And if they pick a pile that already has cards on it, they just cover it completely so you can't see what's underneath it. It's a little bit of a memory aspect to it there. And again, draw a replacement. And then this player has to call out an estimate, but they have to call out an estimate that's higher than the last one. They might call out them and then they, right now they have 10, so 10 is safe, but they're guessing probably they have probably eight-ish in their, in their hand. So they could go quite, quite a bit higher. They could probably say 12, 13, 15, something like that. And now it's this player's turn again to challenge or to play another card. If you challenge, you do not get to play a card. And a part of the, the, the tension, the challenge, is that you want to play the high cards on the piles because they will improve your ability to get cards in those piles. But by doing so, your hand value is going lower and lower. But the estimate is going higher and higher. At one point, one player is going to challenge. When they challenge, they don't get to play a card that turn. They just say, oh, there's no way there's 21, right? The other player gets 21. The next player says, no way. No way is 21. And then they reveal. Turns out the sum is 18 in this case. Now, if the challenger is right, that the, the sum is less than the bid, then the challenger wins. If the sum is greater than or equal to the last bid, then the player who was challenged wins. Either, so either way, one player wins the challenge. And that player gets to pick any one of the five piles to score. If you pick a, a pile that's empty, it's a tie. In the case of a tie, the player who um, won the challenge wins a tie. So that player would, would get a crack at it. But let's say this pile was picked. There's some cards there. You would total up all the cards. You count them out and you total up all the cards, say, that were on that pile and just sum it up. 
and the player who has the highest sum is the one who draws cards from here. So you want to pick a pile that you think you're winning, but of course, because cards are always covered, you can't see immediately whether you're winning a pile or not. You just have to kind of remember, oh, the green is strong in this pile. Maybe I shouldn't pick this one. Because if the challenger picks a, a pile and they evaluate, and it turns out that the other player had the highest sum, then it's that player who is able to get a, a clue card. So that's kind of a fun aspect. So whoever has the highest sum in uh, at this pile gets to pick up this entire pile. They look at it secretly and they pick one of the letters, but they try to look at all of them because they'll, they'll probably need more later. So they, they have a look and they decide, okay, J, J, K, L, M. You know what, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna take this one. They don't have to have to tell the other player what's in it. And they just keep that face down in front of them. If after you collect a card, you have a sequence of seven, you win the game. Now these cards go away. Any other piles that are still here uh, are remain there for the um, for the next round. And starting with the next round, these players will discard their hands of cards, draw a new hand of three cards, and start the next round just like that. If the hands are if the decks are empty, of course you'll reshuffle your discards. Now there's some special cards. This is a times two. What that means is that when you evaluate this pile, if a player has a times two card in that pile, their score is doubled. So they, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter if there's more than one times two. So right now red has three, green has 10. And if it looked like this, green would have 16. So a times two will double it. A stop sign, a little a hand like this, means don't evaluate further, stop evaluating now. So if it looked like this, if the pile looked like this, and this pile was picked, okay, we evaluate, red one, red two, green two, stop. That one stays there for the next round, but you only evaluate these. In this case, it's red three, green two, red would win. That's what the stop does. And the last one is an arrow. If when you're evaluating a pile, one of the cards played has an arrow, that means you won't just evaluate that pile, you will also evaluate the next pile in clockwise order. And whoever has the biggest total there is going to draw um, a, a clue card. And it could be the same player or it could be the other player. And if that has an arrow, then you're gonna do this one. It's possible to, there's lots of arrows, it's possible to do all of them and actually keep going, although I haven't seen it myself. Again, any cards that are evaluated go away. But any cards under a stop sign, for example, under a stop symbol, uh, remain there. So if there are any cards under there, they stay there too. They stay there for the next round. Then you play another round and rinse and repeat. Keep doing that until one player is able to get a sequence of seven consecutive letters. That player reveals it, and they win the game. That's it. You're ready to play Baker Street. Like This game is really tense and exciting, more so than a lot of board games I play. You know, there's lots of board games that you can say are good, but... They don't. You don't necessarily have these sorts of highs and lows, and this one you do. There are moments of excitement and you know cheers and groans because of the memory aspect. Because when you're evaluating a pile, you think you remember what's in there, but you could be wrong, right? I picked this pile because I think I'm winning, and then you reveal the cards, and it turns out you didn't. It's like, oh no, right? Or vice versa, your opponent wins the challenge, they pick a pile they think are winning, and it turns out you're winning and you get the clue. Well, what a twist, right? So, and of course there is that rising bluff that you kind of see in uh, in like Liar's Dice and uh, Perudo, right? Where the, the bid is constantly going up and at some point there's a challenge and, and then you reveal to see who won the challenge. Um, and there, it creates a lot of pressure uh, on players because 
when you're playing cards to the piles, you usually want to play high-valued cards in your hand because the high-valued cards, those are the ones that, of course, will increase your strength in that pile more, right? But you don't know what you're going to draw as a replacement. And if the bid is already quite high, do you play the high card from your hand to increase your strength? Because if you do, you have to increase the bid. And you're, you're, you're committed to increasing that bid before you draw your next card and seeing what that is. And what if you draw that and it's like a really low-valued card? You still got to be poker-faced about it. You still got to increase the bid, right? So it really has that sort of a little bit of a mind game in there, too. So to, that it has all that in this tiny little package, tiny little game, simple game, simple rules... And so that make, actually makes this game quite unique. I haven't played another game quite like it. Even if you count memory games like Mamma Mia and stuff, this is a much different game because it kind of combines the memory aspect also with that bluffing um, in the first part of the round, which really makes it a really tense experience. I, am, I was so pleasantly surprised at this game. I mean, it's definitely better than what the ratings on Board Game Geek would have you believe. You might be thinking, well, okay, if somebody has a better memory than the other they're probably going to win, right? Well, I can confirm, because I usually play this game with my son. My son, of course, has a much better memory than I do. Generally, kids have better memories than adults. Uh, but I do win my fair share of, these, of this game. So it's not just about the memory. And I know that there are some hobbyists who take games really seriously. Don't get me wrong, okay? Games are serious business. I don't think the designer or the publisher had an expectation that everybody would try to memorize like every single card in every single pile. Then when you're looking at the clue cards, you memorize the eight cards in that pile. I don't think that's the intention. I think in a lot of cases where there's memory, the expectation is that you will not remember exactly what's been played where, but you'll just have a feeling, right? You'll create the feeling of, oh, I'm strong in this pile, I'm weak in this other pile. I remember this clue pile had a clue that I was interested in. I think this was the one that had the, the end in it that I needed. And you might be wrong. And that makes for kind of a fun, exciting experience when you expect to be wrong and it turns out you're right or vice versa, right? Surprises in a game. That's not a bad thing usually. Uh, yes, if one person really tried hard to memorize everything and they were good at it, they would have an advantage. But if you just play this casually, which I think is the intention of the designer and publisher, it's you just have that sense of you know where you're strong where you're weak and let the uh, let the excitement come when you when you finally evaluate and see whether you are right or wrong i don't know about you but when i see sherlock holmes on a box or something that's very you know obviously meant to evoke sherlock holmes i'm expecting a bit of a deduction game right maybe i'm trying to puzzle something out even and that's not the case here. There's no deduction. There's no real puzzling. I think they chose that setting because you're using your brain, right? A, to try to remember things, but also the mind game you're playing with the other player. I, I wouldn't like it as an abstract game. I like that it has a setting, but the setting doesn't matter, okay? if Even if you're a Sherlock Holmes fan, playing this game doesn't mean you'll like it because you like Sherlock Holmes. It's just It's the light glazing of a theme. As is usual for these board gems, I don't know how useful these videos are because you you can't buy this in stores anymore. I mean, this game is 17 years old. Um, but because of its low rating on Board Game Geek, it's possible you can probably find a, a copy used. Um, you know, the people who have it, maybe they're not so much fans of it, right? Especially with a low rating. So, you know, if you if it interests you and you happen to stumble upon a copy... Uh, on auction or in a math trade or or just see somebody willing to trade it away uh, if the game sounds interesting uh, consider it i have the whole set i really i pretty much like all the games in the series so i was i was really pleasantly surprised with baker street definitely a board gem for me thanks for watching remember older games like baker street don't stop being good that's assuming they were good to begin with just because new games come out take care